Book of Heaven, Volume 2, Part 2 March 13, 1899 Charity is nothing other than an outpouring of the Divine Being. All creation speaks of the love of God for man and teaches the way in which he must love him. This morning, beloved Jesus did not make himself seen in the usual way, all affability and sweetness, but severe. I felt my mind in a sea of confusion, and my soul so afflicted and annihilated, especially because of the chastisement seen in these past days. In seeing him in that appearance, I did not dare to tell him anything. We looked at each other, but in silence. Oh God, what pain! Then in one instant, I also saw the confessor, and Jesus, sending forth a ray of intellectual light, spoke these words. Charity. Charity is nothing other than an outpouring of the divine being, and this outpouring I have diffused over all creation in such a way that all creation speaks of the love I have for man, and all creation teaches the way in which he must love me, from the largest being to the most tiny little flower of the field. See, it says to man, with my sweet fragrance and by always facing the sky, I try to send an homage to my Creator. You, too, let all your actions be fragrant, holy, pure. Do not offend my Creator with the bad odor of your actions. Oh, please, O oh man, the little flower repeats to us, do not be so senseless as to keep your eyes fixed on the earth, but raise them up to heaven. See, up there is your destiny, your fatherland. Up there is my Creator and yours who awaits you. The water that flows continuously before our eyes also says to us, See, I have come out of darkness, and I must flow and run so much until I get to bury myself in the place from which I came out. You too, O oh man, run, but run into the bosom of God from which you came out. Oh, please, I beg you, do not run along the wrong paths, the paths that lead to the precipice. Otherwise, woe to you. Even the wildest animals repeat to us, See, O oh man, how wild you must be, for all that is not God. See, when we see that someone gets close to us, with our roars, we strike so much fear that no one dares to come close to us any more to disturb our solitude. You too, when the stench of earthly things, that is your violent passions, are about to make you muddy and make you fall into the abyss of sins, with the roars of your prayers and by withdrawing from the occasions in which you find yourself, you will be safe from any danger. And so with all other beings, such that it would take too long to tell them all. With one voice, they resound among themselves and repeat to us, See, O oh man, our Creator has created us for love of you, and we remain all at your service. And you, do not be so ungrateful. Love, we beg you. Love, we repeat to you. Love our Creator. After this, my lovable Jesus told me, This is all I want. Love God and your neighbor for love of me. See how much I have loved man? And he is so ungrateful. How can you want me not to chastise them? At that very moment, I seem to see a terrible hail and an earthquake 
that is to cause considerable damage to the point of destroying plants and men. Then with all the bitterness of my soul, I said to him, My always lovable Jesus, why so indignant? If man is ungrateful, it is not so much because of malice, but because of weakness. Oh, if they knew you a little bit, oh, how humble and palpitating they would be. Therefore, placate yourself. I recommend to you at least Corrado and those who belong to me. As I was saying this, it seemed to me that even if something should happen, it would be nothing compared to what will happen in other towns. March 14, 1899 The evil of man forces God to chastise him. This morning, my most sweet Jesus, carrying me together with him, made me see the multiplicity of the sins that are committed. And they were such and so many that it is impossible to describe them. I also saw a star in the air of enormous magnitude, and within its roundness it contained black fire and blood. It struck so much fear and fright in looking at it that it seemed that death would be a lesser evil than to live in time so sad. In other places, one could see volcanoes, which, opening more mouths, are to inundate also the neighboring country. One could also see sectarian people, who will go on causing fires. While I was seeing this, my lovable but afflicted Jesus told me, Did you see how much they offend me, and what I keep prepared? I am withdrawing from man. And as he was saying this, we both withdrew into my bed, and I saw that because of this withdrawal of Jesus, men would give themselves over to more awful actions, more murders. In a word, I seem to see people against people. Once we had withdrawn, Jesus seemed to place himself in my heart, and he began to cry and sob, saying, Oh man, how much I have loved you! If you knew how I grieve in having to chastise you, but my justice forces me to this. Oh, man, oh, man, how I cry and grieve over your lot. Then he would burst into tears, and again he would repeat those words. Who can say the pity, the fear, the torment that arose in my soul, especially in seeing Jesus so afflicted and crying? I did as much as I could to hide my sorrow, and in order to console him, I said to him, O Lord, may it never be that you chastise man. Holy Spouse, do not cry. Just as you have done other times, you will do now. You will pour it into me. You will make me suffer, and so your justice will not force you to chastise the people. Jesus would continue crying, and I would repeat, But listen to me a little bit. Did you not put me in this bed so that I would be victim for others? Have I perhaps not been ready to suffer the other times? so that creatures would be spared? Why do you not want to listen to me now? But with all my poor speaking, Jesus would not calm himself from crying. So no longer able to hold it, I too broke the dike of my crying, saying to him, Lord, if your intention is to chastise men, I too do not have the heart to see creatures suffer so much. 
Therefore, if you really want to send the scourges, and my sins no longer make me worthy to suffer in place of others, I want to come. I don't want to be on this earth anymore. Then the confessor came, and since I was called to obedience, Jesus withdrew, and so it ended. The following morning I kept seeing Jesus withdrawn in my heart, and I saw that people would come even inside my heart and walk all over him and trample him underfoot. I did as much as I could in order to free him, and Jesus, turning to me, told me, Do you see where the ingratitude of men reaches? They themselves force me to chastise them, as I cannot do otherwise. And you, my dear one, after you have seen me suffer so much, may you hold crosses more dearly and pains as delights. March 18, 1899. Charity is simple. This morning, my beloved Jesus continued making himself seen from inside my heart and in seeing him a little bit more cheered, I plucked up courage, and I began to pray that he would not send so many chastisements. And Jesus told me, What moves you, O oh my daughter, to pray me not to chastise creatures? Immediately I answered, Because they are your images, and if creatures should suffer, you yourself would suffer. And Jesus, heaving a sigh, told me, Charity is so dear to me that you cannot comprehend it. Charity is simple, just like my being, which, though immense, is yet most simple, so much so that there is no place which it does not penetrate. So charity is. Being simple, it diffuses everywhere. It has regard for no one, whether a friend or an enemy, whether a citizen or a stranger. It loves everybody. March 19, 1899. The devil can speak about virtue, but he cannot infuse it in the soul. This morning, while Jesus made himself seen, I was afraid it might not be really Jesus, but the devil wanting to deceive me. After I made the usual protests, there is a footnote at the word protest. It reads as follows. Protest is to be intended here as an interior affirmation of the soul, an oath of her intention not to consent to any temptation of the enemy. In Volume 1, Louisa writes, Jesus Christ taught me that the most effective means so that the soul would remain free of any vain apprehension, of any doubt, of any fear, was to protest before heaven, the earth, and the very demons that she does not want to offend God, even at the cost of her life, and that she does not want to consent to any temptation of the devil. And this as soon as the soul feels the coming of the temptation, in the act of the battle, if she can. And as she begins to feel free, and also during the course of the day. By doing this, the soul will not waste time in thinking about whether she has consented or not, because the mere memory of the protest will already give her calm. And if the devil tries to disturb her, she will be able to answer that if she had the intention to offend God, she would not have protested the opposite. In this way, she will remain free of any fear. Hence, these are the usual protests. Beginning again. 
This morning, while Jesus made himself seen, I was afraid it might not be really Jesus, but the devil wanting to deceive me. After I made the usual protests, Jesus told me, Daughter, do not fear, for I am not the devil. And besides, if he speaks about virtue, it is a colored virtue, not true virtue. Nor does he have the virtue of infusing it in the soul, but only of speaking about it. And if sometimes he shows he wants to make the soul practice a little bit of good, she is not persevering. And in the very act in which the soul does that little bit of good, she is listless and agitated. I alone have the power to infuse myself in the heart, to make one practice virtues, and suffer with courage and tranquility, and with perseverance. And besides, when has the devil ever gone in search of virtues? His hunt is for vices. Therefore do not fear, and be tranquil. March 20th, 1899 the world has reduced itself to such a sad state because it has lost subordination to the leaders, God being the first. This morning, Jesus transported me outside of myself and showed me many people, all in discord. Oh, how much this grieved Jesus. In seeing him suffer very much, I prayed him to pour it into me. But since he still continues wanting to chastise the world, Jesus did not want to pour it into me. However, after I prayed him and prayed him to make me content, he poured a little bit. Then relieved a little bit, he told me, The reason why the world has reduced itself to this sad state is that it has lost subordination to the leaders. And since the first leader is God against whom they have rebelled. It happened as a consequence that they have lost any subjection to and dependence on the church, the laws, and all the others who are said to be leaders. Ah, my daughter, what will happen to so many members infected by this bad example, given by those very ones who are said to be leaders? That is, by superiors, by parents, and many others. Ah, they will reach such a point that neither parents, nor brothers, nor kings, nor princes will be recognized any more. These members will be like many vipers that will poison one another. Therefore, see how necessary chastisements are in these times, and for death to almost destroy this sort of people, so that the few who will be left may learn at the expense of others to be humble and obedient. So let me do. Do not want to oppose my chastising the people. March 31st, 1899 The Preciousness of Sufferings This morning, my adorable Jesus made himself seen crucified. And after he communicated his pains to me, he told me, Many are the wounds that made me suffer during my passion, but one was the cross. This means that many are the roads by which I draw souls to perfection, but one is the heaven in which these souls must unite. So if one misses that heaven, there is no other that can render them blessed forever. Then he added, Take a look. One is the cross. But this cross was formed with various pieces of wood. This means that one is heaven. But this heaven contains various places, more or less glorious. And these places will be distributed according to the suffering suffered down here, more or less heavy. Oh, if all knew the preciousness of suffering, 
they would compete with one another to suffer more. But this science is not recognized by the world, and so they abhor everything that can render them richer for eternity. April 3rd, 1899. Humility without confidence is false virtue. After having gone through several days of privation and of tears, I found myself all confused and annihilated within myself. In my interior, I kept saying continuously, Tell me, O oh my good, why have you moved away from me? Where have I offended you, that you no longer make yourself seen? And if you show yourself, it is almost concealed and in silence. Oh, please do not make me wait and wait any longer, for my heart cannot take any more. Finally, Jesus showed himself a little more clearly, and in seeing me so annihilated, he told me, If you knew how much I like humility... Humility is the littlest plant that can be found, but its branches are so high as to reach heaven, wind their way around my throne, and penetrate even into my heart. This little plant is humility, and the branches that this plant produces are confidence. So there cannot be true humility without confidence. Humility without confidence is false virtue. From the words of my Jesus, it shows that my heart was not only annihilated, but also a little discouraged. April 5th, 1899, How Jesus Keeps Her Overshadowed in His Love My soul continued in its annihilation, and with the fear of losing sweet Jesus, when in one instant, all of a sudden, he made himself seen and told me, I keep you in the shadow of my charity, so since the shadow penetrates everywhere, my love keeps you overshadowed everywhere and in everything. What do you fear then? How can I leave you while I keep you so sunken in my love? While Jesus was saying this, I wanted to ask him why he was not making himself seen according to his usual way. But Jesus disappeared from me immediately and did not give me the time to tell him even one word. Oh God, what pain. April 7th, 1899, Louisa refreshes Jesus. He says to her, I want to make of you an object of my satisfactions. It continues in the same state, but this morning especially it was most bitter for me. I had almost lost the hope that Jesus would come. Oh, how many tears I had to shed. It was the very last hour, and Jesus was still not coming. Oh, God, what to do? My heart was in such a strong pain and in continuous throbbing, but so strongly that I felt a mortal agony. In my interior, I said to him, My good Jesus, don't you yourself see that I feel life missing in me? Tell me at least, how can one be without you? How can one live? Though I am ungrateful at so many graces, yet I love you, since I offer you this most bitter pain of your absence to repair for my ingratitude. But come... Have patience, Jesus. 
You are so good. Do not make me wait any longer. Come. Ah, oh, don't you yourself know what a cruel tyrant love is? That you do not have compassion for me? While I was in this state, so painful, Jesus came, and all compassion told me, I have come now. Do not cry any more. Come to me. In one instant, I found myself outside of myself together with him, and I looked at him, but with such fear that I might lose him again, that tears would pour in large streams from my eyes. Jesus continued telling me, No, do not cry any more. Take a look at how I am suffering. Look at my head. The thorns have penetrated so deep inside that they no longer appear outside. Do you see how many gashes and blood cover my body? Come close to me. Give me a refreshment. By occupying myself with the pains of Jesus, I forgot a little bit about my own, and so I started from his head. Oh, how harrowing it was to see those thorns so sunken into his flesh that one could hardly pull them out. While I was doing this, Jesus would lament, so great was the pain he suffered. After I pulled that crown of thorns off, all broken, I put it together again, and knowing that the greatest pleasure one can give Jesus is to suffer for him, I took it and I drove it onto my head. Then he had me kiss his wounds, one by one, and in some of the wounds he wanted me to suckle the blood. I was trying to do everything he wanted, but in mute silence, when the Most Holy Virgin came and told me, Ask Jesus what he wants to make of you. I would not dare, but Mama encouraged me to do it. To make her content, I drew my lips close to the ear of Jesus, and in a whisper I said to him, what do you want to make of me? And he answered, I want to make of you an object of my satisfactions. And in the very act of saying these words, he disappeared, and I found myself inside myself. April 9th, 1899 Jesus refreshes her from the pains of his privation, keeping her with him in the tabernacle. This morning, Jesus made himself seen and carried me inside a church. There I listened to Holy Mass, and I received communion from the hands of Jesus. After this, I clung to his feet, but so strongly that I could not detach myself. The thought of the pains of the past days, that is, the privation of Jesus, made me fear so much that I might lose him again, that while at his feet, I cried and said to him, This time, O oh Jesus, I will not leave you any more, because when you go away from me, you make me suffer and wait so much. Jesus told me, Come into my arms for I want to refresh you from the pains of these past days. I almost did not dare to do it, but Jesus stretched out his hands and took me from his feet, and he embraced me and said, Do not fear, for I do not leave you. This morning I want to make you content. Come and stay with me in the tabernacle. And so we both withdrew into the tabernacle. Who can say what we did? Now he would kiss me, and I him. Now I would rest in him, 
and Jesus in me. Now I would see the offenses he received and would make acts of reparation for the different offenses. Who can say the patience of Jesus in the sacrament? It is such and so great that it is frightening just to think about it. But while I was doing this, Jesus made me see the confessor who was coming to call me into myself. Jesus told me, Enough now. Go, for obedience is calling you. And it seemed that my soul would return to my body. And indeed, the confessor was calling me to obedience. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 2, Part 2. Fiat.